Okay, our last um, speaker is Arthur Grimes, um, Senior Fellow at MOTU. Arthur completed his PhD in Economics at the London School of Economics in 1987. He is currently the Senior Fellow at MOTU, as I've just said, MOTU Research. He's an Adjunct Professor of Economics at Auckland University, or University of Auckland, Associate Board Member of the Financial Markets Authority, and he chairs the Hugo Group. He was the Reserve Bank Chair from 2003 to 2013 and previously had roles as Director of the Institute of Policy Studies at Victoria University of Wellington, Chief Eco Executive of Southpac and Chief Economist at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the National Bank of New Zealand. In 2005, Arthur was awarded the NZIER Economics Award, recognising excellence in areas of economics that relate to New Zealand's economic welfare. He currently he, he, his current research centres around urban economics, the economics of well-being and central banking, including currency union. A very warm welcome, Arthur. Thanks very much, Lawrence, and thanks for the other speakers and, and the attendees. <coughs> uh, I've been asked to talk about, give an economic perspective on housing affordability, uh, and I wish to address four points. First of all, what are the key influences on long-term housing affordability? Uh, second, what are the roles of things such as population growth, incomes, credit, land prices and other costs? Thirdly, given the uh, audience, what's been local government's role in affecting housing affordability in the past? And then fourthly, what could local government do to improve, improve housing affordability in the future? Let me clarify at the outset that I'll be concentrating on factors affecting long-run housing affordability. There are lots of short-term cyclical factors that push house prices up and down. We saw um, you know, bank lending policies, LVRs, uh, uh, world business cycles, etc., short-term migration swings. I'm not going to concentrate on those short-term factors. The, the key focus is going to be on how we can achieve affordable housing over the long term, you know, past the horizon of the cycle. So there are four key economic relationships that we have to consider. The first is what determines the demand for housing and hence house prices. Uh, we've done a lot of modelling on this uh, and basically the amount that a household is prepared to pay for a house depends obviously on their incomes and on interest rates, less expected capital gains as well as access to credit. The higher is the demand of existing people, the higher incomes are, etc., uh, or of new people, potential migrants, into an area relative to the number of houses in that area, then the higher will be the price. So it's obviously population relative to the number of houses. There's higher incomes, more people, lower interest rates, and a smaller supply of houses all act to increase house prices. Hopefully none of that should be a surprise. Second, what about house supply in the long run? Well, developers seek profits, and so they'll keep building new dwellings, provided it's profitable to do so. Uh, and, of course, provided they have regulatory approval. Uh, so, and essentially, as long as it's profitable to uh, supply new houses after achieving regulatory approval. Uh, but as long as house prices exceed the combined costs of land, construction costs, local authority levies and interest costs, then the supply of houses will continue to increase until such times it's no longer profitable to increase. So, if, for instance, there's a rise in population in an area that causes house prices to increase, then uh, the supply of houses will rise because the prices have risen. Developers, it's more profitable for them to supply more houses. They'll supply those houses at a given set of costs. Ultimately, as with any market, pretty much, the housing stock will expand until prices equal costs. Uh, so in other words, until you know, they'll keep rising until house prices are equated with the sum of land costs, construction costs, local authority levies, and interest costs. But it may take a long time to achieve that. Our modelling suggests that <coughs> In New Zealand, a, a surge in population, for instance, generally takes the housing stock generally takes five to ten years to catch up to a, to a sort of short-term surge in, in housing of the kind that we've witnessed in the last you know ten ten years sort of cycles, uh, and that's a lot longer, I should say, than in most other countries. Third, what about land prices in population? <coughs> Almost all urban economics models, uh, both theoretical and empirical find a positive relationship between city population size and average land prices in a city. <coughs> and that's due to in, um, transport and time savings, etc., of being closer into a city. So the larger your population, obviously the higher the prices will be when you're close to the centre of that, of that uh, city than they will be for a, um, for a smaller town. 
uh, and there's a very good report um, by NZIR, uh, Curt and Lees and his, and his colleagues uh, emphasising that, that point. <coughs> Thus, fringe land prices, land prices around, around the edge of the cities, um, should be expected to be similar for, for different sized cities, but inner city prices and population densities, etc., should differ depending on the size of the city, of the population of the city. Thus, it's no surprise that on average Auckland's land prices are more expensive than Timaru's. And it's no surprising that Timaru's are more expensive than Pateas. Okay, So at the centre of Pate, you don't pay a big premium. Um, <laughs> but you do in Auckland. I won't comment on Timaru. There might be somebody here um, from there. Um, but where fringe land prices are more expensive in one city than another, this is probably a sign of binding planning constraints that are forcing up land prices not just at the fringe, but through the entire city. So we would expect at the fringe that the, the, the house price or the, pop, the land price should be roughly the same as it would be in farming. Uh, where it's not, then it's a sign, clear sign of planning constraints. Fourth, how is population affected by house prices? Migration, and hence population, will be influenced by the cost of housing in an area. The more expensive a house is, the lower, other things being equal, will be net migration. That other things being equal is very important. But when we think about migration, we've got to think about <coughs> four different components. First of all, there's internal emigration and immigration, i.e. within the country. People move to Auckland and away from Auckland from other parts of New Zealand, and same for other places. Second, there's the external emigration. Uh, there's New Zealanders who are moving overseas when we think about net migration. Thirdly, there's external immigration of foreign-born people, and fourthly, there's external immigration, people coming into New Zealand, of returning New Zealanders. Now, of those four components, the two highly volatile components are the emigration of New Zealanders and the immigration of returning New Zealanders. So when we're thinking about migration swings, what we're talking about is migration swings of New Zealanders, not of foreigners. And we're not talking, and there's not, a, and there's some volatility in internal migration, but nowhere near as large. So, the migration swings that we that we see are to do with New Zealanders deciding to go overseas, and New Zealanders deciding to return to New Zealand. It's the responsiveness of the combination of these four groups um, that that affects house prices uh, over over time. So let's turn to some New Zealand evidence on housing demand factors. We've just published a, a, a paper in a, in a major journal in the US um, looking at uh, modelling uh, housing demand <coughs> in New Zealand, uh, and the results are entirely in accord with, with theory. An increase in interest rates leads to a decrease in house prices. Uh, an increase in lending constraints uh, causes a decrease in house prices. We saw that very clearly with the global financial crisis. And of course, as the Minister said, over a number of decades, the relaxation of lending constraints led to an increase in house prices. Demand is also affected by uh, incomes and by capital gains expectations, which may be affected by a whole range of things. R if, if rural commodity prices go up, that flows through to incomes in the cities. Uh, <coughs> if Australian house prices go up, that probably affects capital gains expectations. Uh, and our, our modelling shows that that's the case. In general, what we find is that a 1% increase in population in an area um, relative to house supply leads to a 2.2% increase in price. So if your population goes up 1%, your, pop your prices are going to um, go up by 2%, just over. Uh, although this may not be the whole story because it may disguise the potential population flow into an area, which I'll talk about in a little while. In terms of specific um, <coughs> regional evidence, uh, we did some work in, in the past on Auckland housing supply issues, and hopefully these have changed now, listening to, to Penny and, and, and Lawrence. Uh, but certainly our, our past research in about 2006 showed you know, very heavy impacts of, of planning constraints on prices in Auckland, uh, caused by the MUL, now the RUB, uh, which caused a very, very major change in property prices within relative to outside um, the, the MUL. Now, one interesting piece of, of evidence that's just come through on this, however, is the recent sale or the current ongoing sale of land at Flatbush, which as you may know one of the farmers is selling his land. And when we calculated um, the number of dwellings that were going to be uh, put on that land, it turns out that the sale price is approximately equal to $50,000 per dwelling uh, that's going to go on that land. Now the, the, the value of, a, of, a, of, a, you know, of that land in rural use is basically zero okay, for a section of land. Uh, half a cow or something like that. Um, so um, that $50,000 per dwelling, which is the premium that's being paid to that farmer, 
is, is, is an example of the uh, elevated land price that's caused by planning constraints, and that doesn't just affect that land, it affects all, all property right throughout the city. Okay, so that's $50,000 because of those planning constraints that's added to every single dwelling in the city of Auckland. Um, other research in the past has showed clearly that um, consenting processes, etc., were, were very problematic as well and led to poor um, developments, but as Penny said, some of these things are being addressed. We also, it's not just an Auckland issue. We also did a lot of uh, intensive research on Nelson, Marlborough, Tasman areas. Again, found land use controls, um, uh, lack of infrastructure, as uh, John has, has referred to, urban design regulations that, that affect urban density, etc., affecting those areas. So these sorts of issues tend to affect fast-growing uh, or potentially fast-growing areas. It doesn't much matter if you put an urban growth limit around Pātea. Um, it's not going to have a big effect on it, um, but it is going to have an effect on fast-growing areas. What about migration? Actually, the evidence on the interactions between migration and house prices is really mixed. Uh, I've done some work on this, some of my colleagues at Motu have done some work on this, other people have. Some studies find a very close correlation between immigration and house prices, and at the national level we certainly see that. But at the regional level, um, a, a study by colleagues found, uh, again, some evidence that immigrants raise house prices. But interestingly, it was the immigration of returning New Zealanders that had this effect, not the immigration of foreign-born people. Um, people who come back from London, sell their house in London, buy up uh, a nice property in, in New Zealand, uh, they can afford a lot, I can tell you. Um, and um, uh, I'm hoping my uh, sort of uh, poverty-induced son who's currently living in London may, may uh, one day uh, achieve this. Um, but um, <coughs> um, the evidence on the reverse relationship, how, how house prices affect migration is very limited. We really don't know how sensitive migration is to house prices. We do know that between 2001 and 2006, there was a net emigration of New Zealanders from Auckland. Um, in other words, the high house prices seem to have caused people, New Zealanders, to have just chosen to move out of Auckland to other parts of New Zealand on a net basis. But um, I'm not aware, actually, I've seen conflicting figures since 2006. We need more work on this. So putting it all together, theory indicates that because house prices ultimately gravitate back to development costs, it's the latter that are the crucial determinants in the long run of housing affordability. Thus, housing affordability requires all aspects of costs to be constrained in the long run. Of course, land and possibly construction costs will increase with population. We have to expect that that's the case, um, just because on average, land prices in the centre of the city are going to go up, um, even if prices at the fringe equal the land, the farmland price. So attacking the supply side will be effective, provided there's not a large potential supply of new people willing to come in or uh, stay in at, at, um, at a slight change in price. Another key issue is the city's attractiveness. Uh, we've had different views on, on whether a city should be attractive or not, um, <clears throat> but let's, let's uh, be sort of objective about this. If you improve the amenities in your city or improve the income generating capabilities of your city, that makes the city more desirable. Auckland is a much more desirable place now than when I was growing up in it. Um, so making those, improving those amenities will raise net immigration to that, um, to that area and that will place pressure on house prices. The initial population response will depend on the responsiveness of population to, to, um, to, to amenities. But what it means is that the ability to keep land and other costs in check following that population rise will be really key in determining long run house prices. Basically the more attractive a city becomes the more difficult it is to keep house prices and costs in check. So if you want an attractive city, it will be expensive unless you can stop migrants or unless you can expand the housing supply easily without adding to costs. Basically, to be attractive and affordable, you have to make development easy and cheap. What does this mean for local government, if housing affordability is an aim? First, ensure that there's adequate new land supply for many years ahead, not just on a just-in-time basis. If you do it on a just-in-time basis, just open up new bits of land to, sell, to, to cope with this year's demand, that still gives that developer a monopoly price. Okay? You've got to ensure there's much more demand available than there are um, houses that want to be built, otherwise the monopoly price is there. Uh, I don't think that's been addressed yet. Second, make sure that intensification can occur easily without artificial controls, such as minimum apartment sizes and other unnecessary planning controls. Third, ensure the infrastructure is available in advance to service the newly intensified as well as greenfields developments. And we've heard some of that happening. 
That can be funded on a special rates basis over time rather than development levies, where the special rate, the present discounted value of the special rate is equal to the development levy that would otherwise be raised and, and equal to the infrastructure cost of the infrastructure loan that the Council would have to take out. Fourth, make sure that consenting is fast and is amenable to development and encourage rather than discourage supply of new dwellings. Overall, if you have an attractive city, and many cities in New Zealand are attractive, then it's your choice whether it's large and affordable or contained but expensive. Just don't promise to have it being contained and affordable. Thank you.